Welcome to the Lean Blog Podcast. Visit our website at www.leanblog.org. Now, here's your host, Mark Graben. Hi, this is Mark Graben. You're listening to episode 98 of the podcast for September 3rd, 2010. Our guest today is Pat Bergen. He is the president of Aerofill Technology, a Missouri-based manufacturing company. And we're going to be talking about their lean journey, which started back in 2007 when Pat was originally an outside consultant, and then he became president. Uh, Pat has experience working, uh, among other places, with Art Byrne, formerly of Wiremold. He worked with Shingajitsu and learned uh, under Mr. Nakao, who a lot of you have probably heard of. So he's got some really good lean experience and credentials that he's bringing to his company and our discussion today. So we're going to talk about what it's like leading a lean journey and the role of company president. So, as always, I hope you enjoy listening. Please visit the blog at leanblog.org. Thanks for taking time to talk to us, Pat. Oh, thanks very much, Mark, for having me. I was wondering if we could start, if you could introduce uh, to the listeners first a little bit about yourself and your lean background and also a little bit about your company. Yeah, well, actually, I, you know, I have 30 years of uh, manufacturing and operations experience and have worked um, with a company called Shingen Jitsu out of Japan for several years, uh, learning the lean methodologies of the Toyota production system. And we've currently introduced that here at Aerofill Technology uh, to change the way we do business and actually to change the face of the entire industry. And so when you say changing the, the face of the company, um, what, what were some of the drivers for lean? Um, and tell us a little bit about... Um, your your industry. How do you think lean is going to be transformational or set you apart? Well, we're, we're really excited because we have brought the lean to this industry, and we're really the first ones to do it. So we're kind of blazing a trail uh, for everybody from throughout the entire supply chain. So we've created a lot of excitement uh, again throughout the whole industry, and a lot of people in the beginning were, didn't understand what lean was or the Toyota production system. But today we have engagement from throughout our suppliers right up through to our customers where they're actually flying into our facility and we're having weekly events helping drive down costs and driving efficiencies for all companies, not just ourselves, but our for our customers and for our suppliers. The, the reason we had done it is because back in 2007, Aerofill was in a tough spot. I, I, will, I will be honest with you. We, we had very poor customer service. We had extremely low efficiencies. And we were not a profitable company. And the owners decided that they needed to make a change, and they did a lot of research, and they became, they came upon the uh, Toyota production system as a model that's a proven process that works around the world, and that's where it all began at ATI. And, and you were brought in originally as a consultant with the background and the experience you had, correct? Yes, that's correct. I used to work for a company called Ethelte Corporation, um, whose CEO was Art Byrne. Uh, you may know the wire mold story. Right. And he was brought out of retirement um, to come and be the chairman of the board and CEO of Esselte. And uh, fortunately for me, um, I had started back in the late 80s doing lean manufacturing in a company back in upstate New York and knew a little bit about it. So when I was hired at Esselte, I brought those learnings with me, and my division was the only one practicing lean manufacturing. So Art, um, fortunately for me, I guess out of 5,500 people, I was one of two people chosen to, to lead the charge for Esselte and start making changes for the company around the world. And you were it working? Was here I met, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. It was there that I got introduced uh, formally with Shingajitsu out of Japan uh, and got the formalized training working with Shihiro Nakao, and uh, also Kurosaka-san, who was uh, my sensei for many, many events. And they definitely taught you um, to see the waste and not accept it uh, no matter what. And it really changed the way we uh, see things and do things in business. Well, so I, I'm sure um, – I'd, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more uh, about Art Byrne and, and his learnings that he brought from uh, Wire Mold, because that is a, a famous story, and we've, we've talked to people about Wire Mold here on the on previous podcast episodes. But tell us a little bit about working with uh, Mr. Nakao and Shingajitsu and maybe in particular um, the experiences going to Japan because that's something uh, that a lot of people do work with lean, um, don't get to experience, either the Shingajitsu experience or 
going to Japan. I mean, what, what's your advice based on your experience? I mean, how critical、uh, a factor is that in people really learning about lean and the Toyo production system? Well, I can tell you from a personal standpoint. For me, it, it, it changed my entire life. Where, where I was very blessed in my career working for Art, and then working with Shinjitsu.、Uh, the Japanese have no tolerance for waste. You know, if you think about it,、uh, Japan is an island, so they they don't have unlimited amount of resources or space. So they're driven to to take waste out of the process because they just don't have、uh, the amount of territory like the United States has.、Mm-hmm. So just from that standpoint alone, their culture was totally different than the way we did manufacturing here in the U.S. And they have a、uh, zero tolerance、um, for waste. And to be perfectly honest, they really thought Americans were lazy and just didn't care. So they really wanted that culture. As I started working with them, to learn that culture that you do not accept waste in any form, no matter what, and no matter how big or how small. And so they really drove that home, and、uh, Nakao-san very much、um, made sure you understood and made sure you saw it, and he would not let up even for the smallest, smallest thing. If it was waste, it was unacceptable. So that really changed the culture. Going to Japan, and you go and you see the culture there, and things that we we used to think we were a very clean facility, like at Aerofill, for example. But when you go to Japan and you see all the companies that are now engaged in this process, you get a whole new、uh, look upon manufacturing and how clean it is that you can actually eat off the floor, and I mean literally eat off the floor. Whereas if you came back to any company in the U.S., I don't know too many out there、um, that you can do that with. How did Shinjitsu work directly with your company? I mean, did you find that maybe you know that attitude or? You know, if they were predisposed to think,、um, uh, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, that Americans、um, were, were just in, you know, more tolerant of waste, or as you said, lazy. I mean, did, did that cause any conflict as, as they were working with you or in, in any of your past experiences? Yeah, working working with Shinjitsu, there, there was a, str- a strategy that we actually deployed at Esplay, and、uh, the plan I worked at was the largest、uh, around the globe, and we had like、uh, 600 plus employees. So Art chose to have us be the pilot for Shingajitsu, but we didn't use Shingajitsu everywhere because we had plants in Mexico, we had plants in Europe, in some cases we used also U.S. consultants as well. But for the what we called the、uh, the largest facility or the mothership, so to speak,、mm-hmm. we definitely brought in Shingajitsu, and they came in and they really drove the culture. And what we needed was a cultural change, and the very first thing was workplace organization, and you'd always hear the term 5S. A place for everything and everything in its place. If we couldn't do that and be successful at always putting things back in the same location, how could we possibly get into the disciplines of standard work or SMED or one piece flow if we couldn't even put things back in their place? So we spent an awful lot of time driving and changing the culture. And for us, we were very fortunate again to have someone like Art leading that because most companies, when you do that, you don't see a huge return on investment for that first. Twelve to eighteen months, and that's where a lot of companies will stop and go back and try something else. But Art knew right away. Goes first and foremost is you will have that workplace organization because if we don't get the discipline of our workforce to understand this process, you won't be able to sustain it, and we can't go forward. Now, th- tell me, working with Art, I mean, it sounds like a great experience where Art, as a CEO, was of course deeply involved with Lean at Wire Mold. And it sounds like at SLT.、Um, I mean, what, what did you learn from Art that, that serves you well today、um, in your role as,、uh, as as a, as a president, as a senior leader, and, and maybe you know what lessons you've learned, what advice you would have for other senior leaders、uh, about Lean? I'll tell you the, mo- the most memorable thing I had, Mark, was actually the very first day I met him, because he came into our division, and and we were a very proud group,、mm-hmm. and we had done a lot of work. And we were kind of the, like the rebels of the company. We we had combines in place. We had the visual controls on the shop floor, and we were the only ones doing it. But he came up, and for a simple thing where we had a a die set on the floor, and we were able to get that die changed down to like ten minutes. This one die cart was like two feet away from the, the the equipment, and he came over and asked, "Why didn't you put it one foot away?" <laughs> right. 
And it's the very first time I met him, but that impression at first I thought, oh my gosh, what, you know, what kind of person is this? The, the great improvements this company's made and, and he doesn't see it. But in actuality, I didn't see it. It was by him opening my eyes and saying there's always ways to improve and never think good is good enough and you can always improve. That day, I never forgot. And then later on, after working with Shin Jitsu, it became very clear that there is waste everywhere. And everything we do, both in the shop floor and the administrative, administrative processes that we do, and we continue, we have our, our, and we're in our own paradigms or we don't see it. And by going through that process with Shin Jitsu, it definitely helped to open my eyes that there is waste every step of the way in every process we do. And our job is to drive that waste out of our processes. So what Art did there, I mean, a lot of people would maybe react and say, wow, that's really micromanaging, if, if you will. Um, you know, how, how do you translate um, or how do, how do you find the balance as a senior leader between um, being at the Gemba, the shop floor, having that attention to detail versus also keeping sight of uh, more strategic decisions and, and how lean impacts um, your, your business strategy or your supply chain strategy? Well, what, we, what we've done at Aerofill is we have what we call the Obeya Room, which simply means very large room. And then there we have our, our strategical and tactical um, boards where we actually have policy deployment or also known as strategy deployment. Mm-hmm and where we drive down through this X matrix, we call it, drive the strategies for the company for the next three to five years. We then drive that with uh, what we call PDCAs, plan to check acts, where every manager has to have a plan on how they're going to support that uh, policy deployment for the next year, and they have assignments that are time-bound, quantifiable, and they're reviewed monthly to make sure that they're doing what they said they were going to do to help drive the business forward. But you're right, there is a balance. And part of the day, we expect everybody to be on the shop floor. And I mean everybody, from myself to our vice presidents to the value stream managers to the guy sweeping the floor. We actually do what we call Kemba walks, Mm -hmm. and we walk every single production line every single day, and we alternate uh, between weeks. One week it's in the morning, one week it's in the afternoon, so we can cover at least 16 of the 24 hours uh, of the operation. Now, we haven't figured out how to do the 10 to 6 o'clock shift because it's just very odd hours. Yeah. But we do do sporadic visits where we come there, but we don't have a disciplined process yet on how to have the whole team there overnight. I will tell you, it had a monumental difference in the operation and in the culture where many people never saw managers that they were often working from their office or working behind computers. They now have 100% access to every single manager every day and it has totally changed the morale of the company. So you still pl- so through those gimbal walks, you still may play the role that Art did of, of pointing out ways, you, creating a, a teaching moment to, to help coach and bring bring others along. Is that fair to say? Every single day, and and they've come to expect it now. They get worried when I don't give them <laughs> um, recommendations for improvement. It's like, like my silence. Sometimes they they take it the wrong way and we'll think I'm looking down on something. But our role, my role, our manager's role, is to be there as coaches. It's not to use, um, we use hourly visual controls to drive the business. And when we see that we have abnormal conditions, we don't use that as a weapon, but rather as a tool to really drive improvement throughout the process. And all of our managers know that. If anybody ever um, was disciplined for not having a good hour, so to speak. We have what we call red or green. If we're at an uptime of more than 75%, we have green. If it's below 75%, we mark it as a red, and we need countermeasures on why it's below. But we always use that as a teaching moment and not as a time to discipline an employee. I, I, I think that's a, a very important point you made there because you know, my first manufacturing company, that you know was was trying to to implement some lean practices that were being taught to them by the Japanese. The um, the the old guard managers um, fell into their old habits of basically yelling and screaming when somebody had a bad hour, which led to all sorts of as you were speaking to morale problems. It led to dysfunctions where people started fudging the numbers. It was it was leading in the complete opposite direction of any sort of culture of continuous improvement. So I mean I think it's important that. Um, that you emphasize that. And what, tell me, I mean, what are some other things in, in terms of coaching 
you know, staff or, or managers, some things that you've tried to teach people to help create that culture of continuous improvement where it's not just Pat or, or other leaders pointing out all of the problems? How, how do you instill that um, throughout the culture? Well, what we do is we have weekly what we call rapid improvement events, or RIEs, also known as Kaizen Blasts or Kaizen Blitzes. And we have a, a team composition where we always have a third of it being from the management staff, a third of it being what I call the resident experts who really know the job, and then a third of it being fresh eyes where people have no idea what job we're working on, but they're not set in their paradigm of always doing it the same way. When we have these events, there are absolutely no titles in the room, and everybody really, at first they didn't believe it, but after several events, they started to realize, wow, that even though I was in the room, for example, and I was the president, I was just pat on that team, and I just was one of the people making a suggestion, not the one saying, this is how you're going to do it. And it's the same with all of our managers. When they're on the events, they know they are there as a resource support and to give guidance, but not to tell people how to do it. Because we believe our real experts are the people on the shop floor doing the jobs every single day. They know the best practices. They know the best way to do it. And our job is to be able to pull that information from them and develop good, solid, standard work so that everybody's doing it that same way going forward. Now when you take walks on our shop floor, we actually take an audio system to overcome some of the, uh, the equipment loudness that's on the floor, mm -hmm. and they will actually take the microphones from our hand while we're taking the Gemba walks, and they will pull us in or pull our customers in or pull suppliers in. They don't know who they are, but they're so proud. They come in and show the improvements and ideas they came up with and show the people that are walking through the plant. And it was their ideas because, again, they are the experts, and they have really t taken our company mm -hmm. and turned it around 180 degrees. Now, maybe one thing I want to touch on again, um, you had met, you brought up again uh, suppliers and customers. Um, you, you talked earlier about extending lean practices all the way through the supply chain, which is a, a fairly, you know, you might say an advanced state of lean moving beyond very local 5S, local waste elimination. Can you, can you talk about what were some of the, the key steps maybe in making that transition to a very broad um, systems view of lean? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you, Mark, you're absolutely correct. Even for me in my career, this is the farthest that I had taken it, where uh, even with Ethelte and some other companies, I worked with some very large companies, we've never seen where the entire supply chain has been engaged at once. And because we are a smaller company, we're a one-site location, we don't have multiple facilities around around the world, we're able to drive continuous improvement much more rapidly, but at a sustained pace. You know, you got to be careful not to do what I call the Lean Olympics mm -hmm. and not just sit there and rush and have an event after an event after event and then things go back to the way we were because we're creatures of habit and we like to go back to do things the way we were. But at Aerofill, we do have a sustainment process where we monitor rapid improvements for a 90-day um, continuum where after 90 days, most things, most things become habit. With our suppliers, it started, we started telling them, listen, you know, we're starting to win Toyota production system. We're going to help you. You don't have to go hire anybody. We're going to teach you how to do it. But if you don't get on board, you need to understand you may get left behind. Mm -hmm. You may be one of our best suppliers, but as we start to deploy supermarkets and put combines in place and start to put pole systems in place, your old business model isn't going to fit. Our customers quickly realized that all of a sudden things started to change and our fill rates went from, I mean, it was an abysmal 40%. I mean, it was very bad back in 2007 to upwards to 98%. They started to realize there was changes at aerosol. And so a few people flew in just to take a tour, and they had no idea of the transformation that had taken place in the last two years. And some of those companies, very again, very large companies like 3M, Clorox, several that are already doing lean manufacturing in their own companies realized that this small company called Aerofill was actually, I don't want to say light years ahead, but it was their, their words. Mm -hmm. I mean, we still have a very long way to go. But uh, compared to where they're doing it across the world, we definitely were making uh, broad steps. And so they started actually flying in their own people. And, and even today, uh, 3M, for example, will have their lean guy fly in once a month and come see what we're doing, and he takes that back throughout the whole organization. Mm. The other huge advantage, and, and again, which really catches uh, everybody's attention, is we have taken 
multiple millions of dollars out of the supply chain for our customers. So what better value could a customer have than you reduce their supply chain costs, you give them millions of dollars in return that they can use that cash flow for something else in their business, and their fill rates go up to 98%. Yeah. It really so, is a win-win for the entire supply chain, and the entire supply chain supply chain got it and is now very, very much engaged. Yeah. Well, that's great. That's a, that's a classic situation of, of having both reduced inventory and higher service rates and and fill rates because of um, the lean improvements. And, and Pat, maybe one last thing we can cover here. If you want to address this you know, specifically to your situation at Aerofill or just for the uh, you know, manufacturing industry in the United States in general, there's been, and I've interviewed some other company presidents, um, you know, smaller companies that have used lean as, um, as a way of remaining competitive in the United States to either avoid um, the wave, of, you know, the trend of, of offshoring or actually bringing more work back um, to the United States because of lean improving their competitiveness. How, how do you see that um, playing into um, you know, manufacturing jobs in the U.S.? Well, one of the things that we did, and this is very, very important to the whole process, Mark, is that we committed to our workforce. And, and I had the board of directors of Aerofill all come in and they told every single employee, and we had 550 employees at the time, that no matter what we do as far as continuous improvement activities, absolutely nobody would be laid off from the improvements we made at the plant. That's great. There, there was a concern as we made improvements. Everybody thought lean was it's a way to get rid of people. Now, we had a very, very high turnover at Aerofill where we, we were turning over literally a person every day. Mm-hmm. Under my consulting role when I was there in 2007, I would go in there one week a month, and every day somebody was getting hired and every day somebody was quitting. Today, we're very proud to say we have a workforce of less than 400, and nobody ever was laid off. Some people quit and got other jobs. Some people retired. And as we freed up those people, we just didn't replace them because as we drove waste out of the process, uh, we were able to do those jobs with less. And today, with less than 400 people, we're getting out more production, the best customer progress we've ever had in the history of our company, the best results financially. We had a record year last year, and let's think about last year. Last year, the economy was absolutely in the tank. Not that it's all that much better this year, but last year specifically, and Aerofill had the best results, and every single metric that we measure turned around 180 degrees by doing this process. So that beyond the words of saying nobody is going to lose their job because of lean, um, that sort of success and improvement has got to make everyone feel pretty comfortable that the company is in good shape. That probably means more um, than than just the words. Absolutely. And the other thing that the owners made a commitment, and we're very proud to say, is that we introduced profit sharing for the very first time this year. Now, it was actually in October of last year, and we actually – gave a certain percentage of the profits, and the more we make, there is no cap on it. The owner said, listen, we want our employees to make more money. We want our employees to be happy when they come to work and that they're, they're excited to come to work for Aerofill. So they, they put their money where their mouth is and open it up that the more profits we make, um, the employees get X percent, no matter what it is, and there's no limit. And you would not believe the impact that it's had on our organization. Not only do we listen to the employees, not only do we do continuous improvement activities every single day, but we're truly sharing in the profits. And every quarter, we have a profit sharing check, and we hand that out, and the place just lights up because they've never experienced that in their entire careers. So there's a great case in point of how lean can be a very good thing for a workforce, um, even if people understandably have that anxiety before they know what lean is, that it might mean, uh, like you said, and like people have said many times before, people are afraid of lean, but it can turn out to be a very, very good thing for the company, the customers, the suppliers, the employees, the owners. It sounds like you're definitely on that path there at Aerofill. Yeah, and, and it's a very true and good point that you make is because when most companies, and this is going back to my consulting days, when I went into most companies, and some of them were uh, 500 people and some were 5,000, the very first thing is when they hear lean, they think that they're going to lose their jobs. 
And that's not what lean is at all. Lean is about driving the waste out of the process and making America competitive again. And we inherited a lot of processes through the years, some of them good, some of them not so good. But our goal is to drive that waste out and make it that they're the most efficient processes possible to be competitive in this global market. Well, Pat, I'm glad you're you're doing that work um, that you're doing. I'm, I'm glad you would take some time out to share um, a little bit about your story. Again, our guest today was Pat Bergen, the president at Aerofill Technology, Inc. And, and Pat, maybe if you have a, a, a final tip or a final closing thought for the listeners that you'd like to share. Well, I can, I can tell everybody that the most important thing that I've learned in lean manufacturing is that it has to be so supported from the top on down. There's a lot of middle managers, and I really applaud them, that go out and try to do this process, and you can make some small gains but to be able to sustain and really drive the culture, if it doesn't come from the top, then it really doesn't work. So I would encourage them to go to their managers and get to the top of their organization and help them understand that this is a changing, huge, life-changing event, not only for the people on the floor, but for the whole company, and nothing but good comes out of it every single time. But you need to have that commitment, and it has to be from the top of the corporation, or it doesn't work. Well, great. Well, Pat, thanks again for joining us. It was really a pleasure to talk with you today. All right. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for listening. This has been the Lean Blog Podcast. For lean news and commentary updated daily, visit www.leanblog.org. If you have any questions or comments about this podcast, email mark at leanpodcast at gmail.com.